So welcome back to the Defiant Spirit. I'm Baruch Levy, also known as B, and I'm here in my virtual studio with my good friend and now partner in Enneagram, Julie Miles. Hi, Julie. Hi, B. Thanks for having me. Nice to have you back for Enneagram number two. For anybody who missed out on our most recent podcast together, um, we started a series. I think we're I forgot what it's called, Mindfulness in the Enneagram, which might make sense, but that's what we're doing. We're talking about mindfulness and the Enneagram. Enneagram, of course, or maybe not, of course, if you're a first-time listener, is um, an ancient personality energetic, some say typing system, of nine basic energies or patterns. And what Julie and I really believe is the work of um, Viktor Frankl's idea. He didn't deal with the Enneagram. He was a um, psychologist or psychiatrist and neurologist who dealt with um, how we human beings live and move through the world from a psychological perspective. But he said there's really only two ways of being. Either you're in reaction, you're in unconscious, you're in fear, you're in fight or flight, or you're conscious. You're in what we call response. And you really can't be in the same place, uh, same mode at the same time. And so I know certainly the work that Julie does, which is just a major contribution to my life in the Enneagram, is helping us become more mindful of when we're in reaction, when we're in survival, when we're in fight or flight, or when we or how we get to a more conscious place, a more mindful place, intentional place of response. And there are nine fundamental ways that we can react or re we can respond. And that's really what um, the Enneagram sets out. And that's what we're doing in this series. Now, in this particular podcast, we're taking on Enneagram number two, the helper. Any other names for the helper, Julie, or anything you want to share? But any other names for this one? I've seen the giver, the supporter. Supporter, I've seen lover. It just depends, I guess, in the context people use it. But they all, at least in my sort of estimation, get to a similar place. They're dealing with relationship, right? Mm -hmm. Connection communication, uh, lots of C words, compassion, commitment. Um, all these make a bond with either an individual or a group or you know, you're heard, but there's really this primal need, desire, which all human beings I think have, twos really wear it at a, 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 you know, closer to their heart in a more defining way. Is that, is that a fair sort of 30,000 foot view of what a two might focus on? Yeah, I think they just have this intuitive ability when they walk in the room to see what is needed, to see sometimes more than the, the other people themselves. They just sense mm -hmm. what's needed in other people. In fact, there's been some research that shows that um, twos have more mirror neurons than other people, that they actually on a biology level sense um, what's going on with other people more than the average person. That is super interesting. I have heard that. I. I, it wouldn't surprise me because it's almost like a sixth sense or a superpower mm -hmm. of, I think it was Wayne Gretzky, a famous hockey player, who said, the key to my success is I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck is going. And I feel like that's how twos navigate the world. They don't skate to where you are. They skate to where you're going. Yes. And that's why there's a bunt cake waiting there for you at the <laughs> you know, door of your new house or whatever it might be. Yeah. You're lucky if you have a two in your life. They're amazing friends and they'll give you the world. I actually think it's the one type where you actually can't be this far in life, wherever you are, you're listening to this without substantial twos. Like I, I do think I don't have that many of certain types in my life, but I've never met anybody who hasn't had a two solidly in their corner. And if they, I guess if they didn't, maybe you know, I wouldn't know them, but people I know all have a two at the center of their life. I was luckily, my mom was a two and um, I've shared before I had 11 siblings. And so that was a, an amazing role for a two to have 12 children because her need to be needed was pretty much fulfilled every day of her life, right up to the end. I can only imagine how many needs there were. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, she could tune into every one of them. Amazing. I can't even remember all my kids' names, let alone tune into their needs. So that's that's a, that's a superpower of a two, though, is um, you know when you're with a two because you can feel the energy 
the spotlight placed on you in some ways. And this is, you know, look, everything has a, a, a light and a dark side, a, a blessing and a curse for every type. So this is uh, just the two. The two is oftentimes very good at shining a spotlight on other people's needs. Sometimes the shadow is at the detriment of their own self, of their own needs. Yes. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think in general, a two is so tuned into what everyone needs. And they go so much from that um, that feeling of need to action to doing something for the people that they forget to think about, well, what are my own needs? So sometimes they can exhaust themselves and become resentful because they get taken for granted. And then they also forget to think about whether the person they're helping even wants their help because they just go so instinctively into action and then they can get into trouble that way. And yeah. So um, one question I get asked a lot are what are the mistypes? Like, are there types that look alike? And I think, you know, Julie is an Enneagram nine or she reacts and she responds like a nine. Um, but, and I think that um, twos and nines for me are one of the combinations that at the surface look very similar at times. Now, the beauty of the Enneagram, unlike a, a most of any other system I know, personality system, is that it doesn't deal merely in the surface or what we do or how we do it, it deals why we do what we do. I think for me, understanding the difference between two and nine sometimes just comes down to the why. Mm -hmm. is that, has that been your experience, two and nine? Yeah, um, because I have a lot of two and me too, and I looked at both those numbers, but when it came to the why, where the two's why is really this deep need to be needed by other people, this, they don't have a sense, they get their sense of self through a reflection on what other people say to them. And so that's why there's this outward energy all the time, because they're trying to get that sense of self from other people, where the nine's motivation is to be at peace. And so we don't want to do anything for you. We just want you to be at peace. And if you're not, that's very upsetting to us. And it's not so much a helping energy, even though we can be great at helping people find peace, um, we don't get our sense of worth from other people. But the similarity is that both our energies are going out. Well, they're just so radically different. Un, you know, it's the iceberg. 90% of an iceberg is under the surface. And in order to understand which way the iceberg is going, you don't look at the wind above the surface. You look at the current underneath. The current of a two and a nine, the two, the helper, the nine, the peacemaker, are worlds apart. Energetically, you even just named it. Twos have an outward energy. So even the most introverted two feels a bit extroverted versus the nine. Well, then the subtypes get, make a big difference. But nines, even if they're extroverted, it feels a little introverted, right? right. The energy is always a pulling back, a withdrawing, a withholding. I, I, my life, because I have a daughter who's a nine, I have a sister of a nine, I have half my life are nines. I've never once felt inundated or overwhelmed by a nine. It yeah, well, the other big difference is just that the two is um, constantly feeling and then they act. They feel they act in the world where the nine feels and thinks about it and feels and thinks about it. Then there's inaction. So that's a big right. difference, too. Yes. And that's all these ironic since nine is at the center of action, but they're probably the most likely to not act when again in, in reaction in fear and unconscious. And for a two that is the opposite they go into oftentimes again the lower side they'll go into action and they don't even know they're in your business they don't even know they're helping when not being asked and mm -hmm. it's sort of that um iconic image of the boy scout helping the elderly person across the road and she's beating him with her cane like she didn't ask for this stop being a boy scout so the two has to really stand guard against going into that knee jerk, helping or giving. And it's so hard in our society. It's like a drug of choice because we're told it's better to give than receive. Mm -hmm. You can never give too much. That's a drug to a two. That is the exact opposite message that a little boy to or a little girl to needs to hear. No, mm -hmm. it's actually sometimes worse to give and not receive. Mm -hmm. Experience yeah. that in working with twos or talking with twos? 
Oh yeah. They, um, they give to, at the detriment of themselves and then don't take very good care of themselves. And that's where they get into trouble because at some point they crack or they're exhausted and they become resentful. Like nobody, nobody appreciates me. Why am I doing all this for people? And then they can go to an unhealthy place, which for two is kind of to that a great uh, aggressive eight energy where they're upset and they explode. Although I was talking to a two friend recently and they're like, you know what? We even keep that under wraps just for the people closest to us because we're so embarrassed that we have that side of ourselves that will just explode because we haven't taken care of ourselves and we'll do it on the people that we love the most. It's, it's true. Um, twos have such a heightened awareness of their image. All, all the, the emotional feeling triad, which is Enneagram 2, 3, and 4, the helper, the achiever, and the individuals, they all have a heightened sense of awareness of being out in the world and how they're perceived. And twos are the most. They have the most ability to just know that they're being, you know, so they, they oftentimes put on a really, what you know, attractive, well put together image. Um, and so they're very sensitive to that negative perception. And especially, look, I mean, my heart breaks for them sometimes because even from a little, little, being a little boy and a little girl, they're just reinforced with the same images of, you know, like make sure you look good and make sure you're nice and make sure you're giving and don't take too much. And it's so hard for them to uh, break break free of that grip. Yeah, right. That. It they only feel okay in themselves if they're doing something for somebody else. So it's hard for them to pay attention to their own needs. So it was Rene Descartes who said, I think therefore I am. And he's probably a five. I think if, if he was a two, he might have said, I give, therefore I am. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. But then the hard part is in all that giving, they deplete themselves and then they go to that, you know, explosive, aggressive energy where they might, um, they might just um, get really not the way they want to be. They act not how they want to be. And then they have to beat themselves up for it because they didn't even see it coming. They don't know why. I, why would I be that way? And so it can be this vicious cycle. Okay, I better go back to just helping and then exhaust themselves again. And then it comes out sideways, beat themselves up a little bit and it starts all over again. That's why the power, the antidote for a two is very simple. It's very simple for me to say. It's very hard for a two to do. It's also very easy for me to do because I'm an eight. It's called vitamin N. Every day you must get up, take all your vitamins and add a new one, vitamin N. No, not no comma. This is hard for nines too. So Julie resonates with this, I'm sure. Not no comma and filling in the whole story, qualifying it, putting an asterisk. Hemming and hawing knows a complete sentence, no period. And, mm -hmm. and here's here's the only way a two can do this, in my experience. Saying no as an act of love. I love you. Therefore, my answer is no. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What does that do to you as a nine-two combination, Julie? <laughs> For me. <laughs> Yeah, well, it is it is an act of self care for both, and that's another thing the nines and twos have in common. Um, but for the twos specifically, being able to say no is is an act of self care, which is why it's so hard for them to say no because self care is um, counterintuitive because that means they're not going to be loved. I'm focused here. I have to be focused out here in order to be loved. And so there's this real resistance to turning inward. So in addition to vitamin N, I might add uh, a vitamin alone time. They need to spend time because even if one other person is in the room, their attention gets pulled away from themselves. And so if they can spend some time alone and actually check in with themselves, like, why am I being drawn to do something for someone? Does this person even want my help? And ask those questions, bring the thinking online and and so that when they're doing things, it comes from a place of um, actual unconditional love as opposed from this place of um, doing things for people so that they'll do things for them in return. Totally. And that saying no and being alone are really getting to the heart of the same thing, which is boundaries, drawing mm -hmm. boundaries 
borders line as an act of again as an act of compassion not mm -hmm. as a way to turn somebody away my conversation i've worked with a lot of twos especially of midlife and onwards i don't think a two has much of a shot in our society prior to that to saying no and to being alone because they have been inserted into the lives of others since the time they can remember and then they get to this place of the empty nest or, you know, the marriage is failing or a loss of a loved one and they're forced to be alone or they're forced to experience the no. And then they start to really start to, to grapple with it, to wake up to it. But mm -hmm. I think until you get to about a midlife onward experience, it's so hard for a two to say no or to be, be alone. Yeah, and like our culture, really, especially women. Up. Are you still there? No, uh, I am still here. Keep going. Keep going. No, I see you. No, I see you. Keep going. Okay. Especially so women. our culture, especially for women, encourages this, you know, this endless font of giving to other people. I mean, my mom is a two used to say all the time, you know, oh, just go do something for somebody else. You'll feel better. You know, just this idea that that's how you... Um, how you should operate in the world, especially for a woman. Are we still? I, you know, this is an interesting conversation and we'll do it another time. Can you hear me? Yeah. Freezing up here. Oh, yeah. No, okay. So um, I always wonder, you know, um, male, female, and we're representation on the Enneagram. And I think this is one of those that probably there are more female represented choose only from a nurture perspective. I think at least, you know, in previous generations, my generation, men were pushed out of the two role, not encouraged to be a two. And I think women were encouraged. And um, I think it's changing, but I do think there's a lot of that still in our world, our society. Mm -hmm. Yes. Too. Um, so here's my here's my least favorite Enneagram two book in history, right? I think this book needs to be banned from all Enneagram twos lives and bookshelves, and that is the Giving Tree. The yeah. Giving Tree is by Shel Silverstein. This iconic book breaks my heart, and I think about the two every time I am I giving, giving, giving until it's a stump. There's nothing left. Mm -hmm. And that's, just, that's, that's a reactive, unhealthy relationship and is a reactive too. And I think that's the work of a two. Yeah, right. Um, and let's just talk about that for a second. And I, I can't remember if this is in the book. It, and it's this twos um, that really underneath a lot of the giving is knowing that they're doing it because they think that's the only way that people will give back to them. And there's a little bit of this expectation that people will get back to them and that they don't have to ask for help because I've done this. Of course, you'll help me. And they know that on some level. That's why um, they, they call it the pride of the two is that they think that um, they're a little bit better than other people because they're so caring and because they're so tuned in. And in a way it's a protective thing. So um, they don't have to ask for help that people should just help them. And so they get, can get upset and resentful when someone doesn't. And I don't, I think the tree does go through a hard period where the boy's not doing much for her. It's true. And every time the, she um, chops off something of herself, the boy was happy. Or she was happy because mm -hmm. the boy was happy. I forget how. Yeah, but right, there was right. this, you got to find it within, not without. Right? Yes. It's the work right. of the two. The love, is, love is an inside job. And well, also. And the amazing thing. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was going to say the amazing thing is just when a two does take that time to be quiet and take care of themselves. There's still that amazing helper, but it doesn't come with any strings attached. You can actually feel it in healthy twos that they're doing stuff for you just from this genuine, unconditional love. And I can feel that in a healthy two versus one that's doing something for me and expecting something in return. Two totally different types of two. And, and every two goes through, just like every eight goes through the reactive and the responsive, the unhealthy and the healthy. And the work is to right? To understand why we're doing what we're doing, 
to start addressing some of those voids, those absences in our lives and not asking other people or things outside of us to fill the void. And I see when a two starts doing this work, um, especially midlife and onwards, they really start finding places and pieces inside themselves that they didn't even know existed. It's a beautiful thing. Yes. Yes. Right. And their own um, volition to do things for themselves. And, you know, it's where they, their line to four comes, their creativity it just comes out naturally when they're in a space of taking care of themselves and their natural gifts to the world. But this friend of mine, this, I have a close friend who's a two, and she said the shift is for her from, um, boy, am I glad I'm not you when in an unhealthier space? I'm helping people, but I'm really glad I'm not that person to, wow, I am you. I have the same struggles. I have the same difficulty. You and I are the same and I'm here for you. It's a beautiful um, insight. And it reminds me of um, um, St. Francis of Assisi. There's a famous story about um, St. Francis. He was a playboy uh, before he became a priest. And he was a seven in our Enneagram world, according to Richard, Father Richard Rohr. And he was, um, you know, out in the world having fun, living large. And, and it wasn't until his conversion experience, um, Father Rohr says, and, and I think of sevens and twos very similar, but they have this positive worldview. Um, his conversion came when he had to tend to minister to a leper, you know, and he kissed the leper's head and the pus and all of this ugh, like gross stuff. And, but he realized like, this is true empathy, right? Mm -hmm. This is true giving, not giving what I want, right? Or not giving what I, but, but truly merging and bonding and realizing that, that we are one in this. Mm -hmm. And so your friend's experience really reminds me of the conversion of experience, so to speak, of a two, which is no longer giving as a strategy or as a tool, or but actually just the genuine gift of love, which it means by definition, no strings attached. Yeah, and by learning that, they learn for themselves too that they don't have to give to be loved, that they are also just loved for right. who they are. And that's really the work of a two, is to not only um, give, but to learn how to receive as an act of love. Mm -hmm. Twos don't that is even possible, but it is. If you're so busy giving and you don't allow, you know, I think of, I have that piece in me too, as an eight and a lot of two. Um, I used to like say to my kids, I don't need presents for my birthday. Don't buy me presents. Don't bother. And then it dawned on me, they need to give me something. I don't need anything. They need to be the type of person that gives their father a gift. And so I stopped telling them, don't give me anything. And I, you know, leave it up to them. But now I got rid of that piece and I'm I'm receiving, which is not easy for AIDS either, by the way. But as an act right. of love, point. Right. As an act of love, as an act of giving, ironically. Right. And for the two that I deserve love, you know, I yeah. deserve love just for being, just for being who I am. And so that is the work of a two, that you are worthy of love because you are, period, mm -hmm. not because of the blank. Exactly. exactly. Any final words? about the big picture of two before you take us into the mindfulness experience for twos? Um, well, so we're going to talk, uh, I'm going to go through the uh, mindfulness practice. And um, the same friend I was speaking to said that, oh boy, meditation is just completely counter for a two because it forces you to turn inward and all of them wants to go out. So I just want to say a preface that if this is hard for you twos out there, it's because it is counter to your way. You walk in a room and your energy goes out. So to be guided to go in is very challenging. And yet it's exactly what you need in order to be the best version of yourself. And so we haven't said, I can't believe we've been this far in the podcast and we haven't said the quote, have we? The between stimulus and response, there is a space, the Viktor Frankl quote, which is where um, I feel like the Enneagram and mindfulness come together. So between stimulus and response, there is a space. And it's in that space that we find the freedom to choose how we want to be. So for a two, what does that look like? So for a two, when they are in a situation that's stressful, instead of going, you know, 
going to that eight energy or getting upset and getting angry and aggressive, if they can pause in that moment and turn inward and notice the sensations in their body and stay with those as an act of self-love, what happens is that effortlessly they go to that beautiful space that we talked about where twos just love unconditionally, they stop needing validation, they learn to like themselves as they are. All that stuff just happens naturally if they're able to pause and bring their attention to themselves. And so that's what I'm hoping to offer today is just a little practice where a two can practice that experience of turning inward instead of always being outward. Absolutely. And for anybody who's listening who doesn't think they're a two, think again, because we all have this energy within us. All nine of these are in us. So, you know, the way we're approaching these mindfulness meditations is find your two energy. Um, you may not be a core type two, which is your dominant way, but maybe it's, you know, we have the whole type, the way we think, feel, and act. So maybe you are really an eight, but you also have a feeling piece, and that might be a two, but it's in you somewhere, somehow. And sometimes when we don't really resonate, that's the work. We want to get to all of these energies to have access to all of them, to be able to cultivate the beautiful, responsible side of each type. And so as you're listening to this, um, go through the mindfulness journey that Julie's about to take us on with this idea of how can I awaken and harness this beautiful two energy that's within me? And so with yeah, that, like we're going to I was just going to add that like twos, both sevens and eights also are very quick to action you know, to act. And so um, a meditation practice where you're forced to just come to inaction and just being with sensation is super valuable. So um, I'm going to just make one like brief pause right now. Okay. That way I can find it when I come back and I want to pull this out. So we just have also the meditation. So if you want to circle back to the meditation, you can always just come straight back to the meditation and um, get to it. But here we go. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our happiness. This is the mindfulness journey for Enneagram 2, the helper guided by Julie Mouse. So start by just taking two deeper than normal breaths. And as you exhale, allow your shoulders to soften down your back. And as you're ready, bring your attention to your feet, noticing any sensations that are there. So maybe the contact with the floor, sense of temperature, feel of a shoe or sock. We're just trying to anchor your attention in sensation and we're practicing with the feet first. Notice when your attention wanders or distractions arise. That's just your opportunity to practice focusing your mind. So just invite your attention back each time that happens. And then as you're ready, move your attention up to your hands. What do you notice in your hands? Maybe the contact with your legs or with each other. Maybe noticing tingling or pulsing in your fingertips. Temperature. Also noticing the palms and the back of your hand. And just like with the feet, when your attention wanders or distraction occurs, without judgment, just invite your attention back to your hands. What am I sensing now? And at the end of your next exhale, invite your attention up to the shoulders. 
Soften your shoulders down and back a bit. And then bring your awareness to your breath. So just noticing your breath, not changing it in any way. Following with your attention the whole length of the inhale, the pause, the whole length of the exhale, and the pause again. And just like with the hands and feet, notice when distractions come, your mind wanders. That's just your opportunity to come back. After a two, as a two, you might notice a pull outward to thoughts about someone else. See if you can just come back to your breath each time that happens. Now bringing your attention into the felt sensation of your breath in your body. See if you can feel your breath in your belly. So the abdomen expanding with each in-breath and contracting with each out-breath. If you have a hard time feeling your breath here, you can place a hand on your belly. Just following with your attention the rise and fall as you breathe. If you've placed your hand on your belly, bring it back to your lap. And now I'm gonna invite you to bring into mind a disappointment. Some way you disappointed someone that you care about. What do you think about when you hear the word disappointment? And see if you can think of a particular situation or scenario. Picture that situation in your mind. Notice how your energy is moved from the belly and your breath up into your head and see if you can just let it be there, picturing this disappointment. And then once you have a good memory going in your mind of disappointing someone, See if you can notice where that's landing in your body. Where are you feeling your body's reaction to those thoughts? For a two, because their energy is often up and out, the sensation is often in the chest, maybe the center of the chest, maybe up in the shoulders or even the face sense of embarrassment. What are you noticing? Not trying to change it, rather trying to get to know how your body reacts to disappointment. Tingling, tightness, warmth. Maybe there's an emotion associated to it with what you're feeling. Just allow that to be there. Noticing if the emotion is shifting to different parts of the body, gaining or losing an intensity, maybe moving to a different emotion, just being with it as it is. A curious, loving awareness of what's here. Your intuitive, loving awareness directed into yourself.
allowing it to be the way it is. And as you're ready, letting go of this image and the sensations resulting in your body, and let's come right back to the belly, your breath at the belly, just focusing your attention here. Maybe noticing a shift in energy to a more grounding energy as you do so. Following the rise of the belly as you breathe in, the pause, and then the fall as you breathe out. Maybe you bring your hand back to your belly if that helps to feel the sensation. And then move the hand up to your heart and place your other hand on top of it and just press in gently. Maybe say in your mind, I am loving awareness. It's a practice of that self-love. And if you want to pause the recording here and just stay with that for a while, feel free to do so. And we'll take one more breath for those of us who are staying online. And then you can release your hands and soften your posture, open your eyes if they're closed. Well, thank you. Yeah. Amazing. yeah. You know, my, my intention with that meditation is, you know, kind of like I said, and it is this profound practice for a two to turn inward, um, but also to get to know the sensation that arises when they're stressed, like with a disappointment, so that they can catch themselves because those feelings are your signal. That's your alarm clock that you need to say no, spend some time alone, do some self-care, some yoga, some meditation, so that you can be that amazing version of a two in response. Yeah, I was thinking of um, Blaise Pascal who said, all of life's problems can be solved when we can learn to sit in an empty room. Um, and I don't know what his the type was, but that's really for a, for a two, just to be mm -hmm. able to sit or sit quietly in an empty room. Just be able to sit quietly and still the thoughts and stop the chatter. Particularly, I notice with twos around rerunning relationship conversations or whatever. And so, really, mm -hmm. just to get you know, I think your meditation, your your guided visualization, really helps. Probably twos in particular to be able to learn how to sit quietly. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I asked um, a friend of mine who's a two, what happens in somatically, what do they feel when they're in like a reactive place? And she described her arms going outward, like reaching out, like, oh, I just, I have to go outward to feel okay. And at the same mm. time, feeling a hole right here in her chest. Wow. Like I'm going out because they're, I, I'm not in touch with what's here. So it's interesting because there's an eight that resonates so little. Like I, here's mine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. It's it's just right. interesting how the like, <laughs> images are so different. Yeah, right. right. So, yeah. So. We'll get to yours eventually. <laughs> we'll get to in a few weeks. But um, thank you for guiding us, and for anybody listening. If you want to listen to Enneagram One, that was previous podcast, and of course, next will be Enneagram Three. So stay tuned for mindfulness and the achiever. And until then, continue to defy your number and live your spirit. Thanks so much, Julie. Thank you.